great to be back here in Oxford again. Nice to see you all. And uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me once again. I'm going to speak about um, the, the, the following, as you see in front of you, different phases that we've considered over the years within the Cork group. Uh, I mentioned some of the new phase genera that we've identified. I move on to talking about uh, peptidic glycan hydrolases. And then if I have time, I'm timing myself here carefully, I'll talk about some of the delivery systems that we've also uh, endeavored to use in, in, within the Cork group. These are the various collaborators in Cork that I've worked with. We're not all in the one university. There's two universities in Cork, and there's also the Agricultural and Food Development Authority, Chagas, as it's pronounced, <clears throat> where I worked myself many years ago as well. So we all work together on a number of different phases. And because we have different labs collaborating together, there's a wide variety of phases that we've covered. I'm not going to talk about all of these. In fact, I'm going to talk about very few of them. I'll focus mainly on Staphylococcus aureus and C. diff. And um, the typical things that we do with these phages, different phages, depending on the pathogen, there are different types of applications. So we've evaluated the various applications like food matrices, it could be different in vivo models, et cetera. Obviously, we study the genomes as well, and we look out for any characteristics that might render the phages quite novel, you know, some unusual features, or if they uh, manifest new taxonomic groups. These are all the PhD students that we've worked with over the years. Many of them have, sp have spoken here at the series of Oxford conferences as well. I'll just mention the last student down there at the bottom, Colin Bottomer. Um, he's, he presented over here in 2017, and his work was all about um, the enterobacteriaceae that are responsible for potato disease, some kind of tissue damage in potatoes. And he isolated a number of phages from that. He presented it over here and also established a collaboration with taxonomist Dan Turner. Uh, he produced quite a lot of papers for his PhD, not just these ones here, these seven altogether. But in the course of that, identified a number of new taxonomic groups um, three new genera and also one new subfamily, which has since then, you know, gathered quite a, a number of members within that subfamily. And we were allowed to name the subfamily after Cork. You're allowed to do this with subfamilies. Um, and that's just up there, the different, you know, the, the ICTP registrations of these new genera as well. Um, when you talk about whole phages to eliminate undesirable bacteria, you have one big challenge. The major challenge that I've always observed is bacteriophage host range. By and large, the host range is usually quite narrow. You have to be very, very lucky to find a phage which covers an entire species or genus. It's quite, almost impossible. Um, you know, with any, within any species, you've got thousands and thousands of di different isolates and strains, and they all have different phage susceptibilities. So finding one phage for that species is not the answer. On top of that also, uh, with obviously the, the host range limitation is due to the absence of receptors on various cell surfaces. On top of that, then you've got all these inherent phage resistance systems, adsorption inhibition, um, injection blocking, restriction modification, CRISPR-Cas systems, and abortive infection. And um, restriction modification is one, for example, that you can circumvent and you can make up cocktails by making derivatives of a phage that might be affected by an RM system, you can adapt it to a strain that has these RM systems and build up a cocktail of adapted phages to help improve your spectrum. Another thing you can do as well is just keep fishing for more phages. This table that I'm showing you here, and um, these are all the MRSA isolates. These are all the multilocus sequence types represent that, that are found throughout the Irish hospital system. We've got these from St. Vincent's Hospital in Dublin where they do a central collection. So all of these represent the majority of sequence types of uh, nosocomial infections in MRSA situations in Irish hospitals. We found with phage K, in the early literature, phage K is generally called a polyvalent phage. This is not a good idea because you see that there's lots of cases where the phage is just not working at all. We fished out some of these um, other phages from the, you know, these um, commercially available phage cocktails from the dispensaries at the Eliava Institute. And we found that it's the, the ones which are targeting Staphylococcus aureus tend to have a lot of close relatives to phage K within them. This is phage K down here. We've sequenced a number of these. These are just two that were shown in this paper here. And you can see that the genome is almost identical and also the morphology is as well. But the good thing about doing this, we've done it several times, you find that you're getting complete coverage 
uh, of all the ones where you had gaps, then you fill in these gaps. So this is important in developing phages, which will actually work against a particular target pathogen. Another problem that you can encounter is in food matrices. This, this example here is raw milk. In raw milk, there's various bacterial pathogens that you want to keep to a minimum. Raw milk is used for a lot of different uh, products. For example, uh, a lot of different raw milk cheeses that you make. These cheeses are sold as soft cheeses and can potentially still have a high microbial count. Uh, involving Staphylococci and E. coli is another one that you do find sometimes. We found that against Staphylococcus aureus, bacteriophage K just didn't work at all in the raw milk environment. When you heated up the raw milk, you found that it did work. So therefore, um, it was a heat uh, sensitive factor in the milk that was causing this uh, inhibition of phage proliferation. Uh, scientific literature indicates that these are immunoglobulins, which um, compromise the bacteria and cause clumping of the bacteria and puts them out of reach of the phages. It tends to be genus dependent. We did a study quite recently here. This is phage K and Staphylococcus aureus, T0, T18 hours. You, you add the phage to your bacterium. This is the PFU per mil. After 18 hours, you see with Staphylococcus aureus, there's no increase in phage titer. On the other hand, with E. coli, gram-negative rod, uh, there's your starting titer and E. coli, phage T4 is happy to replicate and is not affected by these immunoglobulins at all. It's, it's limited to the gram-positive cocci. It has been reported with the streptococci as well that you get some clumping of the target bacteria in this particular environment. Uh, we also tried another phage as well, uh, a mycobacterium phage, and we found that the phage could not be recovered at all after the 18 hours. So this particular environment can vary depending on which bacterial genus you're talking about. And food systems in general can present various challenges like this. That brings me to peptidoglycan hydrolase technology, which circum circumvents these problems that you might have with host range. The, the peptidoglycan hydrolase, the first one I'm going to talk about is the endolysin. This is the lytic cycle here, adsorption, uh, replication, maturation, and the release of the progeny phage due to the action of the phage encoded endolysin. It's not the only peptidoglycan hydrolase encoded by phages. There's also a tail tip hydrolase as well, which facilitates entry of the phage into of the phage DNA into the cytoplasm of the bacterial cell. So we've worked with a number of these. This is a tail tip hydrolase. This is the phage endolysin of phage K. And you can see that it's got um, three domains, two enzymatic peptidase, an amidase, and a cell binding domain. The tail tip hydrolase has two enzymatic domains as well. And on this generalized uh, peptidoglycan structure, you can see the different locations where these enzymatic domains actually work. Um, we've been purifying these endolysins. Originally, we did it ourselves using either HIST-TAG or cation exchange chromatography with, with various vectors, quite expensive and time consuming. And more recently, we've started to use this company in the Netherlands, GenScript. You simply email them the, the nucleotide sequence of your endolysin, and they'll send you back the produced endolysin in a little microfuse tube. And they also send you back the E. coli clone. So it's far more time efficient and also more cost effective as well. Uh, they use, they're, they're using the PET vector system, which is, which is quite efficient, efficient as well. Um, you can look at the efficacy of your endolysins using zymograms. This is a polyacrylamide gel, which has been impregnated with autoclave cells of your target bacterium. And you see the zones appearing wherever your endolysin has, has migrated. Um, this is a video I, I've shown before. I'm not showing it as a video today because it takes some time to set up. But basically, to the tube on the left, you're adding a mill of buffer containing the CHAP endolysin and just control buffer to the tube on the right. And then after a few minutes, this is the effect that you see, complete clearing of the tube to which you've added the endolysin. Um, all of these studies, as I say, are with this CHAP domain of the phage K endolysin. It's, the phage K endolysin is quite large, 495 amino acids, and the CHAP K on its own is quite effective. It's only 161 amino acids, smaller molecule, easier to work with. So in the next few slides, I'll be focusing on that particular endolysin specifically. Um, just in terms of the properties of the endolysin, it works over a range of pHs, salt concentrations, and temperatures. That's good stability also. And the best mechanism for long-term storage would be lyophilization and then reconstitution. 
We've also uh, just a couple of slides here showing uh, one application of this. The major source of um, staphylococcal infection, nose, staphylococcal infections in a nosocomial situation in hospitals tends to be the nasal cavity. This is the main reservoir for staphylococcus aureus in hospital patients. So we took 14 animals and we uh, colonized them with a bioluminescent staphylococcus aureus. We colonized the nasal cavity of these animals. Um, we had 14 animals. Seven of them were treated with the CHAP-K endolysin, and seven were left untreated just with buffer. And we could use imaging to see them, uh, to see the, 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 the bacteria if they were present. And this was the result. The lower seven animals here on this particular picture is the animals that had been treated with the endolysin, and bacteriological methods were used to evaluate. And there was actually zero bacteria left as determined by plate count. So as you see, the colonized bacteria are still present in the untreated animals. We also looked at various surfaces as well. I won't go into this, but it's quite effective as a, as a, as a biocide as well. Um, I mentioned host range when I was talking about the bacteriophages. This is the host range of the endolysin. It's quite genus specific. So what you're seeing here with these graphs, this is delta OD, so a long bar here means good efficacy. There's a big drop in optical density in a liquid culture. So the first three red ones there, these are Staphylococcus aureus. These are just some of the MRSA strains from Irish hospitals. These are EPS producing strains from biofilms. And these are coagulase negative Staphylococci, other species of the genus Staphylococcus. They're all quite sensitive to the endolysin. And then just outside of the genus Staphylococcus, these are micrococci. So basically these are close relatives also of Staphylococci. They're some of the Streptococci. And you see, you know, dropping off levels of susceptibility to the endolysin. By and large, the endolysin tends to be confined to its own genus, unlike an antibiotic. With an antibiotic, if you're using it to cure an infection, there's a lot of collateral damage. You're wiping a lot of the bacteria, the good bacteria from your intestine, for example. With the endolysin, you tend to be genus specific. It's quite targeted and it doesn't have the problems that you have with phages, which have a too narrow a host range that, that you're not even killing the genus that you want to in, a, in many cases. Um, this is in silico model of the endolysin. We were very lucky to find out that this, this, this scale up here shows charge on it. Blue indicates positive charge. The endolysin here has a very strong positive charge, which is quite fortuitous. It's not a generalization of endolysins. It's just we were looking in this case that it does have such a, such a property. Um, the cell wall of Staphylococcus aureus is uh, negatively charged due to the tachoic acid. So there's very good attraction between this endolysin and the cell wall. <clears throat> we also progressed to do, doing X-ray crystallography studies, and we determined the X-ray crystal structure of it. We also did a lot of um, site-directed mutagenesis to define all of the important amino acids, et cetera, et cetera. We also did a lot of random mutagenesis as well to see could we improve the activity of the endolysin. We were unsuccessful in that. Nevertheless, we got a few nice papers out of it anyway. Um, we stuck with protein engineering for a while to see could we improve the activity. And one of the successful experiments that we did was when we started shuffling these domains. Here we have the original staphylococcal endolysin, the two enzymatic domains, cell binding domain. This is lysostaphan here. What we did in one case was we took the cell, bind cell binding domain of lysostaphan and we fused it to the CHAP-K domain, giving you this chimeric protein here. So I have a couple of slides here which show you the difference between these in terms of efficacy. On the left-hand side, you've got the CHAP-K original uh, enzymatic domain, and here you've got the chimeric protein. At five micrograms per mil, you see that there's you know, reasonable drop-off in optical density over these minutes indicated here. With the chimeric protein, there's a more rapid drop-off. Similarly, at 20 micrograms and 50 micrograms per mil, you're seeing better with the chimeric protein. You might look at the top here and you see that these are log phase cells. In the real world, your target, generally speaking, will not be log phase cells. You know, in situations like biofilms, et cetera, which cause lots of medical problems, um, cells tend to be more in the stationary phase of growth. And in the stationary phase of growth, there's lots of physiological changes that you do get in bacterial cells. And these tend to make your cells more resistant to antimicrobials, including antibiotics. 
So we also did this study then looking at seven day old ulcers. And again, this is the activity. We're not seeing any activity at five micrograms, a bit of activity with the, with the chimeric protein. This is the native entolysin. And here again, we're seeing better activity with the chimeric protein, showing that that bit of protein engineering did work. So I'll just finish up now with a few words just about delivery systems. I have a couple of minutes left. I'll talk a little bit about secretion vectors um, and then nanoparticles. Secretion vectors, one case where these were sort of insignificant is in the case of Clostridium difficile, which causes very serious um, infections in the large intestine after antibiotic therapy in hospitals. There is naturally a low level of C. diff present in the gut of a lot of patients in the hospital. These tend to be antibiotic resistant and with fairly severe antibiotic therapies, the numbers of C. diff can rise to quite high levels and cause uh, pseudomembranous colitis, which has a high fatality rate. <clears throat> so we fished out an endolysin from a phage against C. diff. It's a tempered phage, but that doesn't matter. An endolysin is an endolysin. Uh, sequence the genome. It was an amidase that we uncovered here. We showed efficacy against C. diff. These are anaerobic plate counts. C. diff is a strict, strict anaerobe, of course. So good activity from the C. diff endolysin. And the strategy that we had was to obviously clone the endolysin, put it into a secretion vector, and introduce it into a probiotic bacterium, which we did successfully. But however, when you look at the secretion levels from it, this is um, your probiotic lactic acid bacterium. It grows anaerobically as well. These are fermentative bacteria that don't need oxygen. Uh, so, um, sorry, this is C. diff lawn on the plate. These are your transformants of the lactic acid bacteria. And you see a zone of clearing around them where secretion of the endolysin has worked. Unfortunately, the secretion level is far too low. If I was revisiting this, I'd use a probiotic E. coli. There's a famous E. coli strain called E. coli missile. Uh, discovered in the early 1900s, which is recognized as a probiotic, that would be a far better system as you have better secretion systems in, in E. coli. Nanoparticle technology, I think I'm running out of time, would that be correct? I'm pretty close. Yeah, we've also looked at various nanoparticles in collaboration with uh, Toby Jenkins at Bath University. I won't go into the details about it because I'm, I can see here I'm at 18 minutes. Uh, we've yeah, tried a temperature, triggered release of endolysin. This worked quite effectively. And also we've been looking at a pH-induced delivery of endolysins as well with Danish Malik at Loughborough University. Um, so I'll, yeah, we've looked at a few other endolysins as well and, you know, successfully did characterizations of these also. So I, I, I think I leave it at that. That's the limit of my, of my time. <laughs>